Hello and welcome to another new podcast episode. And today I'm talking to Isabel Spidelsky. Welcome, Isabel. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And you are talking to us, I believe, from Canada. Well, I'm in Detroit at the moment, but yes. Right. Usually in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> um. I was I was looking at what you were doing and how you got to where you are now, and it has a lot to do with um, with art, right? Design, maybe more specifically. Right. Yes. Yeah. To me, that yes, yes, I would call it art, but yes, yes, you're right. You're you're right. Um, Okay, I'm going to start something just somewhere in the middle, right? Because I remember this part. Um, I was looking at two of your, um, because you you also are into film, right? Yes. I was looking at two of your um, films, um, Find You, uh, short films, and The Ties That Remain. Mm -hmm. um, what What is it for you... Um, what makes filmmaking so special for you? I think that's such a great question, especially in the context of the other work that I do in systems change, which is that filmmaking is the most intense collaborative experience that you can imagine. Because on the day, everybody has to know what they're expected to be doing. And if anybody doesn't show up and fulfill what they promised and committed to do, then you for the most part, can't move forward. It really is an instance where everybody showed up. We have the same North Star. We know what we have to accomplish in that day. And any everybody brings their specific skill set to allow the vision to come true. And I think that is a perfect char characterization of when you're engaged in systems change, the same thing needs to be true, is, is for folks to come in, feel invited, feel that they can be heard and bring their own skill sets and lived experience to bear. And then I will just jump right to um, one of the things that you do, one of the, um, I, 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 I don't wanna say it wrong, but I would say projects that you stop, that's not, that's not what I'm looking for the word, um, but you started the protagonist network? Yes. And it is specifically for women, if I'm correct. So perfect question, because we're iterating as we speak. And so it is at this moment, not only for women, we've, I think, identified that there's a real opportunity for folks with design thinking and making skills to become more adept at understanding the greater context of their work and especially also business principles so that they can really have the impact they want to have creating a better world, which is the topic of your podcast, being active participants. And I think from what I can tell in my experience teaching in postgraduate design studies, that it is still a piece that's missing. And you and I know each other from the inner development goals. And that piece, that mindset piece of knowing yourself enough to be empowered to contribute and to use your skill sets, again, with that understanding of the broader context, is something that we, I feel, need to work on. And it's a great opportunity. So that is what we're focusing on, is helping people develop a design thinker, maker mindset and be able to have impact and also make money because... Everybody needs to be able to provide for themselves, their families, their communities. What, what did change for you then um, when you made the um, participant not only female anymore? Why, why, what happened there? That's a really good question, and I'm going to answer it now in a way that might feel like a lawyer answer because I think we're iterating. And the question that I always ask myself in the work that we do is where can I have the greatest impact? And I think 
I'm working on another idea that will involve, again, a space specifically for women and non-binary folks. And I think there's a, a need of a space for that. In this instance, I think our ambition is really to equip people and meet people where they are. And in this sense, I think I'm using people in the broadest sense, which doesn't mean that if we make the if we reduce the barriers to entry to the community at the beginning and ensure that people who self-select and want to be part of that work can, we can then with the community decide if there's a need for other spaces to be created that will better support them in their own journeys. So I'm listening to what's coming up as people come into the community, engage in the work, say what they need, and we'll see what ends up happening in terms of where can we have the biggest impact and, and what framework or what spaces make that possible. Do you, um, from, because you've, you've been doing this for, is it three, four years now? Protagonist, yes. 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 Did you see a difference how, when you started specifically, how women um, do this, this making and design and making money from it than male, women, men? Do you, did you see a difference sure. there? Well, so part of the, re the initial impetus of creating a space for women is because a lot of the work that I've done in recent years has been in emerging economies in different contexts. And as an example, if you put a group of entrepreneurs in certain cultures, in certain spaces, women might have been socialized to not speak up and to maybe participate in a way that is not necessarily connected to feeling empowered to become an entrepreneur and to speak up and to take up space. And so I think those learnings has made me realize that there are instances where defining stricter boundaries to who's invited into the space is necessary for each participant to be able to thrive. And I don't think the intent is to be exclusive. It is, again, how do you help people to thrive and how do you, how do you invite difference and how do you invite complementarity where there isn't a power dynamic that might hinder some participants being able to fully participate. Is this about um, like creating a safe environment where people, where everybody can speak up and everybody can feel trusted and be heard and be seen? Yes, and, and have the permission to experiment I think society talks a lot about, you know, break things fast and, you know, disruption and, and fail forward and all of these things, which are great in theory. In practice, we're socialized to believe that there's a right and a wrong answer. So if you put someone in, on, in an entrepreneurial setting where all of a sudden they're meant to experiment and potentially initially it won't work, often the case, we have to iterate, we have to pivot, the reality is that there are very few spaces that offer that flexibility. When you're in a job, even in an organization that says they want to be innovative, often it'll be like, we're going to have a design thinking workshop and it lasts whatever three hours. And then you go back to the same setting where there is a right and a wrong answer. You have key performance indicators that you have to meet and that doesn't leave a lot of space to experiment. And so this, I think the same is true of those spaces of entrepreneurship where if you're socialized into a certain gender role and then you're asked to break out of it, you probably need as many reassurances as possible that you actually can do it and it might not be immediate. It has that, because I, I'm looking at this, um... I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Uh, uh, Leservations? Uh, yes, Leservations. Yes. Leservations. Leservations. Mm -hmm. um, you really did your research. 
I, I, I tend to do, <laughs> yes. Um, because there you talk about the LBTQ um, people. Um, mm -hmm. Has it become, and that was in 2014 where you, where you started this, but has it become easier because it's, it's more known today or it's become more difficult? Which, what has become easier or more difficult? Um, to, good question. <laughs> because I, <laughs> to, well, create a space where all kinds of people can come together. And in your case, um, with the work that you do is um, create and design and um, start a business um, because there is so much I'm not sure um, maybe you could say um, um, polarity on this topic right so mm, this is, for sure um, do you feel it's become easier to bring people together and feel safe in this environment? Or do you feel it's, um, you'll become more attacked maybe on that topic? Well, I think to your earlier point, there's a broad spectrum of that. We can see examples of welcoming diversity of thought in its truest form in some spaces and in other spaces, very visibly in the US with a huge backlash against DEI initiatives, it's evident that it's an easy recourse, right? It's always easier to pit us against each other than it is to speak to our common humanity. But I just wrote a really, uh, read a really interesting book, um, Rebel Ideas. I don't know if you've read it, but there's an excellent anecdote about the ways in which we think about diversity of thought and in ways that are really incomplete and don't have to do with the actual science of, for example, you and I have different professions and we have different backgrounds. We probably use different frameworks in our work. And as a result, this conversation that we're having is generative because you're covering an aspect of the problem or the issue that we're talking about over here and I might be covering over here. And as a result, we have a much broader purview of different ways of examining this and holding it up and saying, oh, look at all the different angles of this. And I think a lot of organizations fail to recognize that being the best doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go to the same schools and you need to follow the same schools of thought. And in practice, that's often what we see. I think off mic earlier, you talked about homophily and, and the idea that we'll look for people who look like us and, and perhaps have the same background or economic standards or whatever the thing is. And so I think there's that constant challenge of saying, how do you look at difference, diversity, and not in that sort of simplistic um, diversity is good because it's the right thing to do, but more there is true richness. and. There's another anecdote in that book that I love about why Silicon Valley developed at a much quicker pace than the East Coast of the US because people after work were meeting in places where they would have coffee or drinks or whatever the thing is. And you would talk about what you were working on and I would talk about, I, about what I was working on. And together we would end up in that moment probably generating things and also taking them back to our respective institutions or organizations and that to me is fascinating, but it doesn't feel like that's part of the conversation. What's part of the conversation is you're different, you're an immigrant, you look different, whatever you speak differently, whatever the thing is, as a way to separate us and, and prevent us from remembering that we have common commonalities, but also a need to work together to save ourselves at, at its most basic, really. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, and I mentioned her before in other podcast episodes, 
um, about Nora Bateson mm -hmm. and um, her concept of warm data. And I haven't been I haven't been to her sessions, but I've I've been hearing about it from a friend of mine. And as she mm -hmm. explains it, is is and I I like to copy that explanation. Is that um, so so like you just painted the picture of having both our own views on a topic that we talk about, right? And then um, within the cloud of our own of our own ideas, bringing that together, there is the space where new ideas. Um, originate so so mm -hmm. the 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 thinking right the real thinking actually happens in the space between us instead of just exactly. happening separately in you and in me and i i really i really like the idea of having and that's why i also like having these kind of conversations is um this is where new ideas start this is where my thinking uh, and my views on topics or on the world changes because i get input from you to see, okay, oh, that's an interesting point. How can I use this in my view, right? So I, I really like that part. And that's one of the things that I talk a lot with all kinds of people, but especially with some of my students, is we're seeing a lot in the polarized world we live in an attachment to ideas becoming your identity. And what I tried, because I'm very visual, as you know, what I tried to show them is if you hold ideas like this between us where I have an idea, but I'm, it's not part of me, it's not part of you, then it's, it's much more neutral in that sense. And it's a common thing that we can work toward that doesn't require that polarization of, of I need to be right or this needs to be about me, which then I think is what leads us to true innovation or true progress because we're, we truly all feel that we have skin in the game to make that idea the best that it can be or, or at least move it forward. Yeah, I liked it. I like how you explain that. So the, the, how our identity is connected to the views that we have. And if you could disconnect that more, then there is more, more um, fluidity in, in what we do and, and how we think. Um, how do you see the inner development goals um, connected with that for you? How do you use it in your work or how do you use it in your own work? For sure. I think that's absolutely a work in progress, which is part of the reason why I'm so interested in connecting with people like you and, and other folks to see, because I think there's still a necessity to look at what does it look like in practice? And not to say there's only one way of doing it, but I do see that the mindset piece is neglected a lot. So um, you and I haven't talked about this before, but certainly in, in the larger spaces in which we belong, if we are better equipped to name our biases and name our perspectives, there's so many issues that exist that would be alleviated. And that is not something it is... Well, I mean, as an example, it's been called soft skills for however long. It, it's dismissed. It's this, it's this squishy thing that is not particularly valuable. And, and I think that's attached as well to some of the d definitions or values that we attribute to philanthropy, that it's sort of like this thing that you do because you're passionate, but it isn't because it's not always a hard cash monetary. The change is, is different and can't be measured in some of the traditional measurement tools that we have through capitalism that is somehow denigrated. And so I think the more we can meet people where they are and also reappropriate some language, that knowing yourself and knowing how you show up in the world and, and how you tackle the prism that you bring to that vision of the world, the framing that you have, the better equipped will be to collaborate to welcome diversity of thought, because again, it won't be like, I'm right, like the world is like this. But so many people you speak to have not had that questioning about their own framing of the world. I, I, I just have to say um, how I really admire how you 
speak about these ideas and topics, how you thoughtfully um, think about it and pick the words and and picture it, right? So that you 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 show me what you mean. You show me um, what it means to you, and I I really love that. Um, very carefully Thank done, you. so that's really great. Um, in your teaching work, um, no, no, seven twenty-five. Mm -hmm. That's your company. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. um, paint as a picture. I've read your. A resume so i know what you do but the people who are listening on don't know that and i don't want to paint your picture i think you can paint your own picture very well so tell us a bit what you do in 725 so as with everything else it's evolved a lot i founded it in 2007 and at that time we worked exclusively with not-for-profits and then we became one of the first b corps in canada and i became really interested in social entrepreneurship and understanding how to work within the system, for lack of a better expression, to advance, not just contributing to shareholder wealth, but also looking at the stakeholder perspective. So I would say that what we do at 725 now, I call it social innovation, which is diff very difficult for people to say, what actually do you do? Because it really is a mixture. What we're trying to do is move people from knowledge to action. So what are the tools you need to, as an organization, as an individual, harness the things that you've learned how to do well? So maybe you have a solution to alleviate um, difficulty accessing childcare in rural areas. That's what you work on. So we help you figure out some of the tools that you've used to achieve that result and how do you communicate what you're doing so that you can have more supporters, stakeholders, collaborators, whatever it is, but also potentially if it's appropriate, how are ways in which you can share what you do so other folks can learn how to do it and we can accelerate change in that way. I think that's how I can best characterize what we're doing currently. And, and again, as with a lot of us in this space, trying to understand how do we harness collective intelligence mm. to make all the solutions that already exist to the biggest problems we have, make them accessible, make them visible, make the hindrances to their adoption less powerful. That's the ambition anyway. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure you already running with it. Um, a couple of things I want to unpack here. <laughs> the Because um, I, I like that part where you talk about that you have this idea and you want to grow this part, <clears throat> but also again, not in a traditional way that it's about, you know, um, hiding or protecting your knowledge but just making mm. sure that more people can use it in it you know because if you hide it and or protect it then you have like advantage and power and you can use it to make more money but in your case it's just at least that's how i tra translate it is you make it available to other people so that we can grow together and and make it open to the world so that we can all um um, become better. I, I'm looking forward. Yes, for sure. And um, how do you, how does it, your work, how is your work impacted by this traditional thinking? And because you've been working in this space already for so many years now, um, you know, how to make money, how to make sure that you have enough to live of, um, to support each other, but also be respected in your community and what other people think of you because you're just doing like free work, right? So um, what is it that you, how do you see that, that, that field? Yeah, and, and to be clear, I, I, I'm not, I have to say that I'm not advocating for free work because I think that's probably one of my biggest beefs 
Yeah, is, I, I wasn't saying that. I'm, no, I'm, no, no, no. But just to be just to be clear, because yeah. it's an opportunity to talk about that piece, because yes. I think it's yes. a huge entrant, uh, hindrance to a lot of folks who want to have impact in the world and who are told, good for you, but you're never going to make money doing that. And to me, that, you know, old worn truism of you can do well and do good at the same time is 100% true. And that's why partly I'm so enthusiastic about what is often called stakeholder capitalism and setting aside the capitalism piece. But if, and that's an example that I often give my students because it's it's kind of a, a, a simple one to understand, but it's also really compelling. Like imagine that you open a coffee shop with a stakeholder mindset. If you're if you were to just look at it with a shareholder mindset, then you're like, okay, I'm going to focus on my customers. So say I'm open seven to four p.m. I sell coffee, whatever the thing is. Okay, that's when I'm making money. If I have a stakeholder mindset, I'm thinking, okay, well, wait a minute. I have this space that I'm renting, and I'm in a community. So maybe during the day I'm selling coffee, but maybe I have some neighbors here who ha- need a commercial kitchen. And they don't have access to one. Well, I have a commercial kitchen that I'm not using at night. So why don't I rent them that commercial kitchen? Because otherwise I'm not making any money. So I can rent to them at a good price. I'm making more money than I would be making. Helps me you know, be profitable. And they have uh, an, a place to come. Maybe I also think about uh, not-for-profits in my community who need a space to gather. Again, these, this is a very simple and simple example But to me, it's an example of what happens when you think about the exchange of value with all your stakeholders. It doesn't mean that you're now saying, I don't want to make money anymore, or I'm somehow compromising if we need to put it in those terms. It means that you're thinking about, in a broader sense, what is the exchange of value that you can provide in the larger ecosystem where your business exists? And this is not a new business concept. Before the 70s, Businesses were created with that lens of how do does a business exist to add value to society? And I, I think there's still a whole bunch of people who approach it in that way. And it's simply that the pervasive narrative is still the loudest. I think <clears throat> I am... Oh my gosh! Sometimes I, I'm I'm looking heavily for words to to express myself well, but I'm I'm. We all I'm, have those days. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it is of course. It's not English is not my native language. So sometimes it's mm-hmm. also picking the right word to make sure that you understand what I what I'm what I want to say. But I'm really looking forward to learn from you, um, not just in this conversation, but in general um, um, on this. On this particular part, what you just mentioned, right? So, um, stakeholder capitalism. Um, the way that I've translated this for myself is, um, I know, and of course, I'm I'm not really an entrepreneur. I'm just I'm just a, a one person business. So I'm I'm just keeping my own business alive. That's the only thing I need to worry about, right? So um, I don't have to worry about employees, for example. But um, so I'm my my job between air quotes is I'm a business coach. That's where I make my money. So I help mm-hmm. and I love doing it, to be clear, um, to help entrepreneurs and to look differently at the future, look at long term. And um, I know my enough. I know how much money I need to make together with my wife to have enough. So I call mm-hmm. it I know my enough. And the time beyond that right so if it i can do that in like 20 hours a week for example mm-hmm. and then i have enough the other 20 30 hours whatever i'm investing um giving to for example the the inner development goals right to the organization to support that to um um talk to people about it to give workshops on it and i do that for free um uh, because i I know I have my enough, right? So I don't need more. I don't need to do this for money because I, the other part has already given me the money. Um, and at the same time, but just, we're just saying, I can also hear 
Yes, but, right? Yes, that's a great way of looking at it, but you could also look at it this way. So I, that's why I'm just saying, I'm looking forward to learn from you from, on, this, on this topic. Not, I'm, not that I think I need more because, like I said, I have enough, but I think um, there's a lot more people like us that could use this perspective, right? So that you could, you know, look at the way that you just described this example you just gave, um, how you could how you could organize this, right? So how you could sell your space or your time, um, you know, to other stakeholders. I I really like that idea. You know, personally, I've had to work a lot on my narrative around money. So it's it's a life, you know, it's a lifelong journey, and to unlearn that piece about being values driven means that, you know, it, it's, it's so often, especially when we're working with not for profits you would see people running events at night, working their full job during the day. And people would say, oh, you're so passionate about this is great. And, and they weren't, their salaries w- were not commensurate with the effort. And there's nothing wrong with being passionate. There's nothing wrong with volunteering. That's not at all what I'm saying. But it is my f- firm belief that if you're wondering how you're going to support yourself, support your family, you can't have the full impact that you want to have in the world and there is no real reason for that to be happening except for this narrative that has been perpetuated, that only certain things have value. Yeah, yeah. And we mentioned the word capitalism already before. And you said before the 70s, it was just a normal way of, of, of working. Um, so the whole idea of the um, GDP, right? So the whole idea of yes. having like a number which includes supposedly all valuable work. Mm-hmm. And then we leave out a lot of work that people do for free for the community, for their neighbor, for their parents, for their children, um, because we say that's not valuable work. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, when we had like um, the pandemic going on, the most important work, the most valuable work that we see that we was important to the community, to everybody, was exactly these kind of jobs mm-hmm. that were paid not enough and or even not. And these were the one who had the right to go to work because otherwise um, other people wouldn't survive or have a good life at the moment. So that's an interesting idea, right? So, so what? Well, how can we change the way that society looks at this, like you just said, um, in a way that, you know, it's it becomes more um, fair? Um, mm-hmm. Well, the decoupling, I think, of work from wages is, is part of the issue, right? If hmm. you can become... Uh, to your earlier point about monopolies or about proprietary, you can become a billionaire because you have this that other people don't have access to. So so that's, uh, of course, part of it. Um, I'm going to tie it back to a little bit of what drives me in my work to your point, because I don't think that I have the answer of how you change the whole, you know, the whole narrative. However, I do think that part of the issue that comes into what you just mentioned in terms of first, first responders or the folks that were considered you know, essential workers during the pandemic and are always essential workers uh, that are mostly invisible the rest of the time, is that when someone has to have two or three jobs to make ends meet, to make sure that they have food on the table, those folks are essentially being stripped of their ability to show up as citizens. And it isn't because they don't want to think about it. It's not because they don't want to contribute because they are contributing. Um, And so how can we create more spaces more space maybe for everyone to have the ability to show up as a citizen, as a contributor in that way, because I think that's where you build an awareness of what can be valuable beyond what we're being currently told is valuable. But that requires, again, that time, that space, like you want to go to your child's football game. You want to be able to have time with your family, all of those uh, simple things. And 
that's, I think, the biggest damage, aside from the obvious, of, of the huge disparity that exists uh, in economic terms. Because that means that, especially if we say, as in my work, that engaging folks with the lived experience of the problem you're trying to solve is essential and you need to consciously, to your point earlier about inviting women's guests on your podcast, you need to try to see the people you don't see. And if, if that intention and that implementation further than intention doesn't occur, then we replicate the same issues because again, with our biases, with our desire for homophily, we are not aware of the needs and requirements of and, and difficulties in other people's lives and opportunities. Hmm. And at the same time, I have to say, it's very, very difficult to see your own biases and to um, intentionally at least try to act differently, right? To at least try to do something different than what your normal bias says you should be doing or mm -hmm. what your brain says you should be doing. It, it's, it's really hard. It is. It's a, it's a lifelong practice. You know, one of the things that I do for myself, and again, it's part of my job, but that's one of the things that I, that I uh, try to teach folks that, that I get to work with, is a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs, they're afraid to do what we're doing now, which is to speak with other people. They, they're they like, oh, I created this great solution. Okay, have you spoken to any potential? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. So if you're able to get beyond that fear and really approach that exchange, and maybe you can extend that to your life even when you're not an entrepreneur, what can you learn from the person that's in front of you? and really listen. And I think that's the challenging part is that we always, again, we, there are right or wrong answers, so we want to be right. So we want to have an opportunity to, to speak. But when we listen, so I'll give you an example. I was working on a project and, um, and I was doing research on the financial products. And I had an interview with a woman who was from Mexico. And she said that she put her money in a U.S. bank. And I, in my mind i didn't say anything but in my mind i thought oh she must not trust mexican banks and again i'm i that's just what came to me but to my credit luckily because it was early in my career i asked her why and she said because it felt like geographically it was far away from her and so that she wasn't going to touch it she could put her savings there and it felt like it was far away well so not only is that an insight that i can bring into potentially the solution that i'm developing but it's a perfect example of how often in a conversation we inadvertently impose what we would have said, what we think is the logical answer. And 100% it's very difficult, but it's also so liberating in a way because you don't need to be right. It's just like, just listen. So I think if we try to incorporate that in our daily lives, well, first of all, we learn a really a lot. And, um, and, and it takes some, that pressure off being right all the time. For me, anyway, I, that's, uh, yeah. I think, I think that would be a, a really great thing for es especially men to do. Um, uh, that would also take a lot of pressure of men to try to always be right, even though they probably don't experience it right now as a pressure. But I think if you would, use this practice this practice more often you would learn that it really is a pressure to um always try to you know put your story forward or your ideas or your right um and listening to people like yourself is the fun thing always is uh, if you're an entrepreneur or not if you if you ask questions, just like the question you just said, why, right? It's just, it's just a very short and simple question. Um, it gives you so much information. Uh, 
And you can be very relaxed in that conversation by just listening to the other and learning instead of thinking about what your counter would be, right? What your response would be. Just ask the question like, why, right? So somebody who's buying your product, why? Right. So then you'll learn so much from the people who are buying your product instead of just thinking, oh, this is my product and this is how it's supposed to be used, or this is what this what it will bring to clients. Just mm -hmm. ask why did you buy it? And then you will you will learn so much more about your product or service. That's that's so valuable. And it's so like you just said, liberating. It's also very relaxing because you don't have to think so much. You just can just spend time just um shut up your brain and just listen right yeah and the in insights can come later if that's what you're looking for, for yeah. Sure. yeah yeah absolutely yeah can you think of like one or two other examples of projects that you're doing now or that you have been doing that's um worth sharing um I'm, we're working on a lot of interesting stuff right now i think so one of the things that I'm always thinking about is how do we how do we acquire knowledge and how do we connect dots and to help us move forward in our work because again and 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 this is a lifelong learning for me I I'm uh, I'm someone who learns all the time and I'm all, so I'm always reading but I'm always taking courses it's sort of an you know ongoing joke with my friends and family because whenever I say something they'll and they'll say like how did you come about this information I'm like what do you think so yes I'm I'm an I'm an avid learner and and I think it's it's evolving so just recently I uh was supporting developing a really introductory course on AI and it we ended up experimenting with making it almost like TikTok style in terms of the delivery of the content. And I had to really push through my own preferences around the pacing at which I like to learn and, and the rabbit holes that I like going down. And a book that I read recently, um, and now I'm going to forget the title, Curious Minds, was super helpful to me to visualize how the tree of knowledge might develop and, and the, the different ways in which people learn. So some people want really deep knowledge and other people prefer to go wide and then, uh, or send other people off to bring them back information. So that has been the focus of a lot of my work in recent weeks is looking at how can in the in the three buckets of what I do. So for me personally, how do you develop learning materials that are visible, accessible, useful to learners in different settings? How do designers become better at translating knowledge into uh, bite-sized or again, appropriate learning materials? Like what are the tools at our disposal that help us disseminate? Um, and then lastly, from an organizational perspective, how do you support the learning of your core talent within the organization? And then how do you disseminate your learning as an organization to help uh, the ecosystem around you move forward? So it really is about trying to understand by what mechanism is collective wisdom created and then how is it disseminated are the big questions that I'm that I'm grappling with. And so in turn, and those are the three contexts in which I'm getting to test things. So two of them are with clients and one is within protagonist or within 725. I'm not sure, but I felt this was the first time you, you called it clients <laughs> mm -hmm. until now, yeah. every time you call it students. <laughs> Uh, yes, well, because so with 725, we have partners, clients, um, and, and, uh, and with my teaching at, at university, uh, I, they're my students, and at, at Pratt, they're at, um, in protagonists, they're also students, learners. Right. Do, yourself, do you see yourself like a teacher today, or more like 
something else? Um, well, I think I'm a lifelong learner, and and I think I would define myself as a facilitator, maybe more broadly. Hmm. Facilitator. Interesting word. Does it, is transferring your knowledge to other people, <clears throat> is that part of your learning process? Well, see, because I, I don't think that I would define it in that way. So I think as we, you and I discussed, is that we're creating, it's in our exchange that we create the knowledge. And I'm not saying that I don't have expertise. I do. And I have lived experience. And I think to me, the, in the environment of academic teaching or in the environment of running a workshop for a large corporation or running a workshop in, within Protagonist Network, it's the same exchange that occurs where there's an opportunity for us all to learn. The other day in uh, my university class, I was giving, and we were looking at a chart of positionality and it had sort of privilege and different dimensions of your own identity and sort of how you might identify and in what instances might you be in a position of power and privilege and in what instances with your own identity might you not be not more like oppressed or, or, or not, not privileged. And a student um, who's not from the U.S. said this, this is a very, you know, North American perspective. And I said, absolutely. And so we had an op opportunity to discuss how she was viewing it. And it enabled all of us to benefit from that different perspective. And so, yes, I think I would consider myself a lifelong learner and trying to put myself in positions where I can contribute, but hopefully invite contribution. And that is just as difficult as identifying your biases in my experience. <laughs> I um. So you're my, you're more like enabling learning. Ideally, yeah. Yeah, and I think sometimes my students in university setting maybe get tired of me, like asking them, "How's it going? Like, are you reading the resources? Like, how?" And of course, I can gauge if they're engaged, if they're participating, if they're asking questions, if they're contributing their knowledge. I can, I can gauge that engagement, but as an example, the other day, um, it was clear that they had not looked at the resources and I was like, okay, so I curate these resources. Why are you not looking at them? And it was like, oh, well, we thought it was optional. So it's not, you know, it's not always, it's not always a given that you think you're creating space and yeah, it's, it's a constant, it's, it's a process, right? Yes. Yes. I, uh, yes. I, I, again. Well, and as a coach, I'm sure you know that, right? Because you can, no, and, and, you can but, coach people all you want, but. <laughs> no, but and, and again, I was just, I was just thinking how, how valuable this view is to me, how you look at, 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 at knowledge and making it possible for other people to engage with the knowledge or, um, to absorb it whenever they you know want or re are ready for it or, and and also creating this space for people to have these conversations to learn new things instead of just reading from the books just having this conversation with each other and to learn from each other like the example you're just giving so to get a, a different perspective from another culture because if if you are in like um you mentioned earlier about these one of these high you know these very high paid um, schools, not high paid, uh, expensive schools. Um, you're all in a kind of similar environment. We have similar backgrounds, similar culture and historical ideas. And it's very difficult then to see a different perspective. Um, that, it, there is a great, there's a great Dutch book about this. There's also an, there's also a great American book about, it's about equality. And I've, I forgot what the title was, um, but I can look it up. And the 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 whole I think the word is premise. The whole mm -hmm. um, 
concept of the book was that whatever the problem is in the world right now, inequality has a lot to do with it. Mm. And if the world would be more equal, everybody is better off, not just the poor people, the rich people as well, right? So mm. the privileged people, the everybody would be better off. So that so I I like that idea of just being in an environment where these conversations are possible. So to see different perspectives from different cultures, from different histories uh, on the same topic is going to make us all richer, right? And not in money, but in everything mm -hmm. else, right? So, mm -hmm. yes. yes. How do you correct, characterize the work that you do as a coach in terms of, of like, what what is your superpower? <laughs> well, um, if, if for, to, to make it a bit easier for myself, I say I'm a business coach, right? So, but then I'm focused heavily on accountability and um, creating action. So what, what entrepreneurs often have, but also other people in, in life, but I focus on entrepreneurs because I like them, um, is the day-to-day -day work um, on their desk or on their minds or in their inbox is already consuming so much time and space that they don't have time for, you know, self-development or for um, long-term projects, right? So I want to have, I have this great idea of this thing I want to do with my company in the future. And what I want to do is to bring that future closer, right? I want to help mm. them to accomplish that project earlier because um, it's a really important product or service that they will develop for a better place or a better project or a better um, value for the market and not money wise, but specifically to create a better world. And um, what I help them to do is to carve out space, time um, to do this so that it they respond differently to input. Mm. Um, to make sure that they spend time with the things that are really important to them. And of course, that could also be, like you mentioned before, um, spending time with your kid going to their sports game or with your partner to do something mm -hmm. else, right? That could be the same thing. That's, uh, if you're saying that's important to me right now, okay, let's carve out time for that because that is important too for me. So, um, yeah, I would say that's my superpower to really – bring that picture of the future that they have closer to work on it now instead of saying i want to do that one time but i don't have time now right absolutely well that's powerful that's powerful if that's where things get done is when you actually implement everybody can have ideas but if you don't set aside the time and that's great yeah and like I said, I, I, I just love doing this. I, to me, it's so logical. It's so, you know, it's so, I would say, easy to do, easy to do yes. for me, right? It's so, uh, I, can, I can grab the ideas and say, okay, you got to just do it now, right? Because, come on, you have to do this, right? It's so important for the world or for your, your family or for yourself, right? So let's do this. So that's, for me, it's just so costs almost no energy yeah you, you you found your power that's what yeah it. yeah i'm as you can hear i'm i'm really happy with that that's wonderful <laughs> what is, what is your power then i think my power is synthesis so i can i can see connections i can i can distill ideas and often if someone is engaged or an organization in, is engaged in multiple activities, I can, I can help distill what's happening and make it visible to folks. I think that's my superpower. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Um, to, to round this up, um, looking at the inner development goals, right? Mm -hmm. How do you say, how do you see, does that play a role? I have two questions um, in your work and how you will, how will you 
form your business? Um, and the second question is, what, what do you think that the inner development goals still need, uh, is missing when, when you look through your lens and, and, you know, maybe probably the things that you know about cultural differences um, from your students or from the work you've done in the past, what you see, what really is um, still needed for the inner development goals? Two questions, sorry. I think I'll start with that because it's a work in progress in terms of the thinking that I've been doing since I found out about the inner development goals, which is fairly recent. It was just last year, for just before the summit, is that implementation piece. I think we have to meet people where they are and, and there's still a narrative to reimagine around the rediscovering or embracing our common humanity and not looking at it as this these separate soft skills. And this seems obvious that that how we show up in the world as individuals at work, at home, in our in our public or private lives is an intrinsic part of, of who we are. And yet there's this artificial separation as though we can put on our work suits and become this profit machine. I, I It seems simplistic, but our inability or, or our propensity to other is nurtured by a lot of the narrative that we're seeing around us. So I think that is the biggest thing to tackle and understanding where can you meet people, where are the entry points or the levers or the nodes where having doing a precision intervention, if you will, will have a ripple effect is what I'm trying to see. Like where are people already, because again, a, a bunch of people already have initiatives. I, th I think of, of Coralis, for example, um, which is a community of, of, of women and non-binary folks reimagining new ways of not only looking at how money moves around, but also how we can create, create that collective wisdom to live in, in, I don't want to say a parallel world, but kind of reinvent a system within the system and, and see how that can pollinate. And so that's an example, I think, of what we talked about earlier of where are initiatives that can define a strategic area of influence. So whether it's in an academic setting, whether it's in, you know, in the, in the way we attend conferences, in the ways that we share knowledge or, or may, make knowledge available in the spaces that we create that can be generative, uh, welcoming and, and allow for a diversity of approaches and thoughts. How can we accelerate that and then as the hubs are trying to do for the inner development goals how do we make visible what's already happening so that the mapping of the ecosystem can enable us to reach resources knowledge experiments data faster does that answer your question yeah yeah and i i think that um You can have like a great impact, and um, addition, but that's not the word I'm looking for. <laughs> contribution. Yes, contribution. Yeah, to... because when I say I, I mean we, right? Yes, yes. No, but <laughs> but I, I I I see the value that you that you can bring here that you bring. Um, to the community to 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 make that happen to make it work right to to make it better well then how do we i think the big question that i'm constantly asking myself is is who, who needs to issue the invitation like how can we each find our own invitation to contribute I like the question because I had the same question this week in the Global Partitions Network. We were in, in breakout rooms. And this one lady from Sweden, she was talking that she was with a colleague 
in the co-working space and they were talking about all these ideas that that they were having and they were like bursting from ideas and bursting with new things that they want to bring to the world and and she was feeling that she was waiting for an invitation to speak and if and if she didn't get the invitation but she would speak up that she would feel like if that she would not be a fraud but be um bloating um talking too much about it right so sure and and I'd, I, I, I didn't ask a question, but I said to her, well, actually, I, I, I phrased it like a question. What if you already have the invitation? What if the invitation was given to you by you know, the universe or somebody divine because we just had somebody talk about God and or, you know, by just me saying to you, you're invited. Go and talk, right? So, what if that happens? So, why do we need an invitation, particularly from somebody or so, or, or or a group? Um, yeah, that, that's a question. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Isabel. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for um, um, sharing uh, your learnings and sharing your insights and ideas and um, crafting your th thoughts and ideas so so thoughtfully um, it was it was a wonderful experience and to have this conversation with you thank you very much likewise thank you so much for inviting me and I cannot wait to have more of these generative conversations with you it's always a, a delight to to get a chance to exchange so thank you and to distill my own thoughts <laughs> <laughs>